SJ. Welcome to Muskogee Radio, your weekly source for tribal and community news, interesting guests and discussions, plus a local events calendar. SJ, Stone Go, Gary Fife, Jaho Jeff Gados, Muskogee Radio, Mabu Hedged Owedskis. Uh, we are back into studio this week, a nice air conditioned studio, and gotten rid of that wild craziness out there on the festival grounds last year, uh, last week rather. We hope you listened in. We had a lot of fun doing it, and we're dealing with a lot of surprises there, like getting knocked off the air by a transformer or something, whatever locked up our phone line there for us. Uh, anyway, we uh, left our wheels spinning there for only a few minutes and got back to it. But it was a fun show, and we hope that uh, to do more more things like that in the future. I know Darren had, a, had got a kick out of it. <laughs> but uh, getting back into the studios and uh, a little more serious uh, subject this week, um, we're talking about some of the um, uh, social issues and laws, changes that have happened in uh, recent times affecting um, uh, foster care, and uh, we had a representative in the White House during the United State of Women's Conference, and we're, get, we're going to be talking to all of those folks. Uh, first of all, Kimmy Wind Hummingbird, and uh, where what, Robin Wind. Jeez, I almost lost myself on my own notes there. They've come to us today to talk about uh, some new rules that were handed down uh, by the uh, Interior Department uh, regarding foster care and related subjects. And in our second half, we'll be speaking with Sean Partridge, who's almost become a regular with us, to talk about her visit to the White House and the, uh, the conference that was held there. But first of all, uh, uh, let me introduce, uh, welcome our, our guests here, uh, Kimmy and Robin. Thank you uh, so much for making time in your schedules to uh, come in and, and, and talk with us on the program today. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Now, I understand you two are uh, related there. <laughs> we are. <laughs> um, yes, she and I are sisters. Okay. It's not often get a sister act in here, but <laughs> we thank you so much. And uh, you're, you're working in such an important uh, field for us right now. Now, uh, first of all, let me, uh, rather than me mangling your program titles, Kimmy, uh, let's, let's have yours first. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I am the program manager over the State Reunification Services 11-County um, in-jurisdiction program. I work with, um, m my team and I work with the children that are in DHS custody. Okay, and Robin? I am the program manager over foster care and adoption, certification and placement. Um, my unit goes out and certifies foster homes and places children. So you actually get out in the field and visit these places that might be prospective foster homes. Yes, sir. Uh, let's, uh, I guess, start off with the overview of the uh, program. Now, what is uh, the formal title and what's it designed to do? For, uh, Kimmy? Well, um, as I said, we work with the kids in DHS custody. Our kids that we work with are not in tribal custody. So mm -hmm. my team, we um, attend court in those 11 counties. Um, we're very active. We are um, in constant contact with the Department of Human Services regarding the children and the families that are in custody with them. We do make visits with the children. We visit with the families. We attend court hearings. Um, we're actively involved advocating for our children and our families if um, we feel like... Um, something isn't going right in that case, we want to make sure that the Indian Child Welfare Act is, is followed. And that's kind of what our goal is as we monitor these cases for compliance with the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, and uh, Robin, um, the, I guess the formal title for your program once, once again? Certification and Placement. Okay, and that involves? Foster care and adoption. We handle the applic applicants who want to be foster or adoptive parents as well as relatives. We go out and um, do home assessments, we run background checks, we certify the homes, and then when there's a need for a child to be placed, we offer placement for those children. Right. Now, uh, I guess uh, what we'd want to start off with is, you know, how's the, how are we doing? How's the tribe doing uh, uh, in past programs? And the, so this topic has been discussed. There's always been a need for more foster homes because there's a lot of kids, Muskogee children out there in state custody rather than tribal custody. And 
Yes. Where are we still in the same place, or are things changed? Yes, sir. We we absolutely are. There is a. a a huge need for foster homes for the protection of our children. Whenever we go into court, that's one of the, the very first things we look at is placement. We want to make sure, number one, these children are placed with relatives. If they're not with relatives, we want to get them with um, people within the, within the chair, er, I apologize, the Muskogee Creek Nation. Um, we unfortunately don't have a lot of homes. Um, and so that's our goal, is we'd like to get more homes, enough to have placement for all of our children in these homes. Right now we have about 350 Muskogee Creek kids in custody, and of those kids in custody we have um, a- about 200 that are placed with relatives or within what we would consider an ICWA-compliant home. Um, and so we're, we need about 150, uh, uh, the availability to place 150 more children in our homes. Mm-hmm. So this might be... Uh new families signing up or yes sir uh, or relatives Uh yes sir um of course like i said we we look at relatives first so um if a child is removed that's the first thing we're talking with dhs about have the relatives been researched yet to to get those children placed with them and if they if eligible relatives are eligible then that's our first placement preference and that's a that's an easy fix because it's so much easier for children to go into a home that they know mm-hmm. go into right. grandma's house auntie's house which you know whoever relative that they're familiar with than it is to go in with someone that they're not familiar with their surroundings uh, and it also strengthens the uh, cultural ties for, to their heritage and tradition and and to the tribe absolutely yes sir um, now, can, uh, Robin, uh, you're working on the state end of it. Uh, is, is, did I get that correctly? I actually um, certify homes for um, tribal foster or tribal custody kids. If we have extra homes and there is a need, we will uh, attempt to place children who are in state custody. Like uh, she said, the goal is to have enough homes for everybody, so we don't have to rely on the homes who are certified through DHS. Do you have some numbers there, the number of Muskogee kids that are in state custody right now? Uh, it's over 300. Oh, gosh. It's around 350. 350. Are they all from this area or scattered? or? Um, uh, that's that's throughout the state. Okay. Yes. And I would assume a lot of them here in Omulgee and yes, Tulsa sir. and some of the other towns around here. Yes, sir. Uh, and um, in recent uh, years, uh, we've seen some... Uh, placements that uh, became the folks of like a media circus you know the uh, the one the one with the Cherokee tribe uh, baby Veronica and I understand there was one uh, fairly recently with uh, with the Choctaws and they ended up in different directions with Veronica being uh, taken from a father who was a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and placed with uh, another non-native family and then uh, as in the case of the uh, Choctaw uh, girl, she was placed with Choctaw families there now. Had two different outcomes there. Um, now, I, I'm going to ask you all for your opinions. When you saw that baby Veronica thing uh, hit, the, hit the media, you know, it's like, you know what, hits the fan, and it was all over the place. Now, we've spoken with Chrissy Nemo and some of the folks from Cherokee Nation about uh, what they saw and felt, and... The way they argued that case. Now, does that kind of thing uh, uh, come into what you do? I mean, uh, is that echo still there, so to speak, uh, of, of, of losing one like that? Yes, sir, it is. And the reason I, I hold it a little bit personal is because uh, prior to my employment here at Muskogee Creek Nation, I was with Cherokee Nation Indian Child Welfare for oh 14 my. years. Yes, so I was um, over there whenever the onset or the onset of that case began, and. Um, I, the thing that just really was disheartening to me was the misinformation out in the media. Mm-hmm. It was very uh, disheartening because the, the full story was not out there. And of course, there are confidential matters regarding this child. And they, there was, um, if, if um, the father and the, and the Cherokee Nation would have stepped up and, and played the role that the, um, the adoptive parents did in the media, I think there may have been a different outcome. But because of the confidential nature surrounding that case, they did not. And that's exactly what they should have done. Um, so there was a lot of misinformation out there. And, um, I, I, you know, I, we were all very disheartened whenever that came down, whenever um, she was required to go back to mm-hmm. the adoptive parents. One thing that uh, was kicked around uh, among some of my colleagues and. Uh, and other other folks 
that uh, never really became a prominent part of the case is, was, was that mother, natural birth mother, compensated? In other words, did she sell the kid? Um, we don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't have anything to, to back that up, but uh, that just still is a disturbing thought now. Do you have any light to, to shed on that? Um, it, yeah, that is a disturbing thought, and if we were to believe what was out in the media, it sounds as if, you know, maybe she did, and that's that's just what was put out in the media. Again, I don't have that personal information, uh, but, you know, if everybody believes what was out there. Mm -hmm. Robin, your thoughts on uh, I, agree, I agree with Kitty. It was a very disheartening result, and um, I just I was very disappointed in the media coverage. Um, that's why I'm very happy that um, Muskogee Media looked at the Choctaw case and um, brought to light a few things that people may not have known. Good. Uh, one of the uh, issues being talked about in, in both of those cases was, was blood quantum. You know, like the, one of the children was like 164th or so, something, something to that effect, and uh, a similar degree in, in, the, in, in both cases, actually. Um, should that actually have any bearing uh, in, in a placement? Uh, is it like if once a citizen, always a citizen? I mean, uh, where does that kind of work out? No, sir, I don't believe so. And in fact, the new regs, they talk about the tribe is the one who can determine who is a member of the tribe and mm. who isn't. But um, I'll use my three daughters as an example, and I do this often whenever I speak about ICWA. Um, my oldest daughter is very dark complected, dark hair. My middle daughter is medium toned and, and brown hair. And then my youngest daughter is very light skinned and has blonde hair. Um, and I'll, my youngest daughter will be the very first one to let you know that she is Muskogee Creek. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, I... But a child, a, an Indian child is an Indian child, in my mm -hmm. opinion. I, I don't think blood quantum matters. I think we fight every day for our Muscogee Creek children, and it doesn't matter their blood quantum. We don't look at that whenever we, before we put on our armor and we walk into the courtroom. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, Robin, you? Well, we love them all. I, I agree with everything she said. Um, it doesn't matter the blood quantum. If you're Indian, you're Indian. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some of the placements that I was aware of in as a beginning reporter that's decades and decades ago more than I'll discuss right now but uh, it was it was said that ever uh, when there was a placement of a non uh, of an Indian child in a non-Indian family that sooner or later that would pop up and become a uh, uh, horrible factor in their life uh, it's like uh, I think there were some 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 talk of, of Navajo children being placed with non-Navajo uh, families and when they grew up every time they looked in the mirror they saw they weren't the same color and began to uh, feel the pressures and, and sometimes abuses from the society we're in saying you know like what's this dark skin blank blank doing here and among all of us white folks yeah, excuse me there <laughs> but uh, that's what we were hearing that uh, that would be uh, one cause for, for all sorts of personal social disruptions, like uh, leading to uh, substance abuses and sometimes, unfortunately, suicides and things like that. Now, that was then. Um, are we still looking at situations that you are aware of where that has uh, become such a factor in, in children's lives? I mean, yes, sir, unfortunately we are. I have had the opportunity to go to many trainings throughout the nation, and whenever I do, I seek out two certain types of trainings. I mean, of course, I attend all of the trainings, but the two that I, I always make it a point to go to are, of course, the, the boarding school, the, mm -hmm. the trauma, and um, the, uh, if there's an adult adoptee group, I go to those because I can't tell you how many times I have heard those adults stand up and say, continue to do what you're doing, fight for these children because I feel different. I, 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 and they would say it's not that my birth parents, or, you know, it's not that my adoptive parents didn't love me, but I'm different than them. I don't know what it is, but I feel it. I can feel it down deep. And not only do I look different than them, I, I feel different than them. And it's nothing that they can do to help me figure that out. It's me. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's heartbreaking whenever we hear that. But whenever they come around the room and hug your neck and tell you keep ba fighting that battle, then that, that's what ignites the passion or, or you know because like I said I've been doing this for a little bit I've been doing this since 1999 now and I love what I do I absolutely love what I do um 
and I, I'm, like I said, I'm fortunate that I have a great team that shares our passion that, you know, we know why we go in there and why we fight for these children. Robin, you're on down in the trenches there and um, seeing these children and then places they're going. Uh, um, does any of that thinking, any of those thoughts or experiences ever work into what you have to do? Absolutely. I, I'm aware that we have, we have many foster parents and adoptive parents that I've met over the years doing this that have been adopted by non-Indian families. And um, it's funny that they, they say exactly what Kimmy mentioned. Uh, they do feel like they don't exactly belong in the society no matter how well they're raised. So they're champions for our children. And they seem to sign, sign up in uh, more numbers than just, you know, regular people. But, um, you know, we always have a passion to place our children where they can experience their culture and their heritage. And that is why we always ask for more foster homes. We, we need to place them as soon as they come into custody because it makes Kimmy's job harder if they've been placed with a non-Indian family for a year and she's got to go into court and battle it out and have them placed with an Indian family. If we have those available, then we don't, you know, it's not, not a big fight with the, with the, in, in the culture from the beginning. Um, another question in that same vein to both of you, and uh, let's go theoretical here. Uh, if uh, a, a non-Native family is quite well off financially and is able to provide a really, really nice home, et cetera, et cetera, uh, versus um, a Native family that isn't quite doing as, as well, perhaps, um, do those uh, factors figure into what you do and like well if this kid gets here he's going to go to a better school or have you know nicer clothes or whatever and, and etc but if he goes here with his native family he's going to know who he is and he's going to know his perhaps his 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 clan his his family uh, if they're traditional uh, they're, you know his their stomp grounds etc or 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 the church the indian church that they go to and strengthen that and uh, that's quite a juggling act to have to deal with uh, so what are your thoughts there? Again, our, our, my position would be that we would want that child either with a relative or with a Creek home. Mm -hmm. uh, we do. We do see that often. You know, there um, are other people that feel like maybe they are better suited to parent our children. And that's, again, while we go into court and we say, you know, I, I, I thank you for being a foster parent. Thank you so much for doing that for us. But we have we have foster homes or adoptive homes that are available for our children who understand the what it feels like to be Creek and, and um, you know again if you don't know it and you haven't lived it you can't really provide that example to them now I'm not saying that other other nationalities or other races would not be able to uh, provide good mm -hmm. a good level of care mm -hmm. for our children but like I said in speaking with those adult adoptees I I've heard their stories I've seen their tears I know how they feel as an adult and that's why I go in and do what I do mm -hmm. As, as Kimmy said, our first choice is always to place our children with um, Creek families or relatives. If that doesn't, um, if, if we don't have any available, then we look at um, homes that are other Indian tribes. We have a placement preference according to uh, federal and tribal code, and we follow those. So, and nowhere in there does it say that one of our Indian children should be with a non-Indian family. Mm -hmm. Nowhere. Uh, I was looking at... Uh one of the social media sites that criticized the Indian Child Welfare Act and said it only divides things. It doesn't do anybody any good. It sticks kids with homes that aren't quite as well off as others and is more trouble than it's worth. Uh, would you, uh, either of you have thoughts about criticisms like that? I beg to differ. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. As I stated earlier, um, I feel like you know the the people who live it are the ones that can can teach it, and um, we have that personal insight. We know mm -hmm. what it is to be Mississippi Creek, and um, that's something that's 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 just us. Mm -hmm. yep. I agree. When we go out and we certify our homes, we have a section in our home studies specifically for culture. And um, in those home studies, we include how the family is connected to the tribe. And it is part of our expectations that they keep the, any child that is placed with them connected to their heritage. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's an extremely important part as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Um, let's look to the changes that were handed down from the Interior Department uh, recently. 
Um, they've been characterized as strengthening and tightening up uh, the rules involving placements and things like that, uh, giving tribes more say in, in what's, uh, what's to be done, that uh, this blood quantum issue isn't quite the, the angry dog that people think it is. Uh, what did we see in these new rules? Um, well, I, I really think it, um, it, it about the, the very first thing is that they need to treat every case as an Indian child it, if they have a reason to believe it may be an Indian child from day one. Because I think that's where some of them tend to go wrong is if um, they don't, they m might think that they're Indian, but they, they don't necessarily treat it that way. And of course, you know, we, we talked about placement preferences. There's l different levels of evidence for, for Indian families versus non-Indian families. So that's something that is that is considered the gold standard, that they um, treat all these cases as, as Indian cases from day one. And that's that's one of the major changes, that if they have reason to believe that that, um, that, that child may be an Indian child, that they're going to treat it as an Indian child from day one. Um, it also talks about whether you know the the tribe has the the right. Of course, we've we've us as tribes have always known this, and that's kind of been our, our argument sometimes in court, especially whenever you're talking about blood quantum. We are the one who determines if this child is an Indian child, and if we say this child is an Indian child, that child's an Indian child, and this kind of kind of reiterates that a little bit. Um, it kind of beefs up the definition of active efforts. Um, that's something that in state courts. My team and I, we, we request active efforts letters, um, and it's something that's going to be required now to for them to submit at, at each hearing, so that's good. Um, and those active efforts basically talk about the efforts that the department has provided with this family to um, reunify this family, what they've done if they've um, taken mom and dad back and forth to the classes they need to go to, if they've taken mom and dad to the visits that they need to go to, those active efforts versus just telling mom, hey, you need to get there at five. And active would be going and picking up mom and making sure she's there at five. Mm. So um, it talks about being a qualified expert witness. Um, the fact that that witness now needs to um, have knowledge of the prevailing social and cultural practices of the tribe. And that's something that we've always kind of advocated for. And like I said, uh, my team, we're pretty vocal in the courtroom. And so they know that we're there and they utilize us as the expert witness in our in the counties that we work in. Um, it talks about a reason to deny transfer, a, a good cause reason to deny transfer to tribal court. And at one point, they used to use the advanced stage, uh, advanced proceedings, or the, the, this, the court cases at an advanced stage, and so they didn't want to allow those to transfer to our tribal court. But now that's been said, that's not a good reason not to transfer. If the tribe wants it, you have to have a better reason than that not to allow the, mm -hmm. tri to ta the tribe great, to take it. Talks about reasons not to uh, um, go along with our placement preferences. Um, those are kind of the main ones. There are there are many, and we're so thankful that these have come down because it's like I said, it's something that we've kind of went into the courtroom and have reiterated all along. But now it's just a little bit more um, loudly. Uh, now, Robin, let me ask you: do, do these changes give you more strength in what you do, uh, more decision-making power? Make does it make it easier or uh, more clear in what you might? do or not uh, not have to do perhaps mainly what uh, how these new regs affect my program is that is the play, placement preferences it gives Kimmy's unit a little bit more um, of a push in court whenever DHS or um, the judge may not be want to move a child uh, that's in a non equal compliant home so that's that's the best thing for these for me from these regs where do we go from here? Uh, what kinds of things might our people see kind of filtering down and uh, changes that might be visible, or is it pretty much uh, strengthen what you're already doing? Yes, sir. I believe it does that. It just strength strengthens m what we do even more so. And you know, I want to just say that we're fortunate that the counties that we work in, that my group works in, they're very equi-friendly. I mean, they're from time to time, we do um, have some hiccups that we have discussions about, but for the most part, um, my team is very visible and they know that we're there and we're there to provide input and like I said, monitor for compliance with the Indian Child Welfare Act. So if they have any questions or, or issues or concerns, we are addressing those before we walk into the courtroom. So we're all kind of on the same page. Um, so my team's very, very vigilant about, you know, 
going out and making sure that that um, the Indian Child Welfare Act is being complied with in our counties. Um, like I said, from time to time we have hiccups, but um, we're able to generally work those out. Um, next question, I guess, uh, and we'll be wrapping this up pretty soon. Um, the media has played quite a part in coverage of this issue. And unfortunately, some of my colleagues uh, play the sensational angles up, you know, the crying child ripped from family home and taken forcibly to, to whatever. and. Uh, um, you know, go after the low-hanging fruit, shall we say, in, in the kindest terms I can think of. Uh, what would you uh, think that our, peop our, our, our reporter or our journalist need to, to do to, uh, to fix the problem and more adequately and accurately uh, report on these stories? I would hope that they would take the time to gather all the facts instead of just taking one side and running with it. Um, and again, because the, of the confidential nature of these cases, um, there's not going to be a lot of information that can be shared. Um, but th there's there's more than just one side of the story. I mean, and you know, Congress found in 1978 that the the greatest value, most valuable asset to the tribe is its children, and we have to protect their children. Mm -hmm. And so that's our that's our goal that's why we go out there is because we're protecting our children the best we can last question to to both of you and this is again once again a personal uh, thought uh, um, let's start with you robin what is the price that you ha might have to pay personally to to deal with this subject uh, obviously there might be some defeats but conversely there might be some victories there so what's it What's it well, cost to you? I tell you, um, as Kimmy will attest, this is hard work. And it's also hard work for our foster parents. Um, they don't just hang around and collect a check. They're doing what they can for the children and often taking them here and there and uh, visits and doctor's appointments. Why I stay in this is because uh, I feel like I, I've been called to this. But whenever I'm at an, an adoption finalization and I see a child who was in a... Um, bad situation to begin with and they're now in a Loving Creek home and they have the opportunity to um, enjoy their heritage and the richness of their heritage that makes that makes me come back to work every day no. well and and just to add a little bit on top of that I I mean I I agree the reason that we do what we do I think it probably we probably have a personal interest um, you know of course I've we all have stories in our background and um, I think the reason that I do what I do is um, the fact that you know it's important that we keep our children with family and siblings together I think that's a big issue that I, that I feel like that our siblings should be together well I have this feeling that we're on the right track and making progress the fact that these issues are out there now and being contested and won in many cases uh, means we feel like we're winning so yes sir it's because of the work you two do and, and many others and, and and some very nice people in foster homes and if you're v even the tiny bit interested in in the subject please give uh, these folks a call um, we need foster homes. Uh, there's not enough of them. And if somebody wanted to become involved, how do they get in touch with you too? Well, they would, I'm sorry, contact um, Children and Family Services. Our direct line is 918-732-7869. And you can ask for a foster care and adoption and just let them know that you're interested in picking up a packet. Quickly, I, I would like to mention that Kimmy and I said that there were 150 children at any given time needing homes. We have 11 foster homes and 17 adoptive homes, and every, we're all full. Mm -hmm. So if you think you feel like you need to do it, come on down. There's a place for you. And I didn't mean to choke you up with that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. We appreciate uh, you two coming down, um, Kimmy Wind Hummingbird and Robin Wynn. Uh, we appreciate uh, the information you've shared, and hopefully uh, there'll be people who want to become involved. Yes, thank you for having us. Okay, my go, my do, my do, my do. All right, we're going to take a short pause here, and we'll be back with uh, Sean Partridge uh, to talk about her trip to the White House. So stay with us here on uh, Muskogee Radio on 1240 The Brew. Who am I? Am I Indian? Just because I'm a girl from the res, don't make things up about me. What if I move away? Then who am I? Some kids try meth just to escape. But then I think about my grandma, my little brother, my beadwork. 
my poetry, and I think I like who I am, and I know meth is not for me. Check out NCAI.org, a message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Who am I? Am I native? I don't want people assuming things because I'm Indian. I just want to be me. But how do I live in two worlds? Some guys just check out by doing meth. But that ain't for me, because I see my family, my friends, my drum making, my future. There are a lot of cool things about being who I am, and meth isn't one of them. Learn more at NCAI.org. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. You're listening to Muskogee Radio here on 1240 The Brew in beautiful downtown Okmulgee. Kind of, kind of a warm one here. Uh, sitting in the studio with me now is Sean Partridge, a probably a familiar voice now. Um, someone who's been in enough to almost be a regular here, right? Yes, good morning, Gary. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Uh, we understand you had a uh, wonderful trip to Disneyland on the Potomac and uh, <laughs> got to visit uh, Stahecki House. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, for the United State of Women Conference. Now, that word state is not plural there. It is singular. How are we doing? Uh, first of all, uh, what was that conference all about? Yes. Oh, my gosh, Gary. I was so excited. It came up really kind of last minute. I hadn't um, heard anything about it, and um, I was extended an, an invite uh, from the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. And so the United State of Women, um, which is a summit hosted by the White House, unfortunately it was not at the White House. That was my first understanding. And so um, it actually included, um, had over 5,000 or close to 5,000 uh, people um um, mainly women that participated from all over the U.S. and actually some from around the world. And so it was hosted at the George Washington uh, Convention Center in D.C., a very, very large convention center, obviously, to host 5,000 people. Um, the doors opened that morning at uh, 6.30. We were there myself um, and about 20, 25 Native women um, who had grouped up. Um, mainly we were there for our work on issues regarding violence against Native women. Uh, we were there in line at 5.30 and uh, ready to rush the doors when they opened at 6.30. And so it was really was um, such an amazing opportunity and, and um, a tremendous, um, I mean, obviously public figures, but then also women, you know, boots on the ground, grassroots advocates on a variety of issues um, that also participated. The only, um, the only negative and kind of downside and disappointment of it all was the lack of Native women uh, mm. participating, right. and so. Uh, that, I was going to get to that. First of all, you know, I've uh, been to a White House conference and actually got to walk around and Did you? sit on the furniture once oh, in the red room. Uh, and I knew that the East Room was going to be way too small for something like that. But uh, out of uh, what is uh, they said, 8,000 delegates, there mm -hmm. were what, maybe 20, 30 Native, Native women? I think they said close to 100 okay, maybe that good. had been Im invited. Yeah, we were all, um, Deb, Deborah Parker from Tulalip um, Tribe, who's been very active politically and certainly in um, most, I think, um, known recently for her work on the Violence Against Women Act and going to D.C. and really knocking on the doors and visiting with legislators um, to help um, increase support for the tribal provisions. Um, she was one of the speakers on one of the breakout sessions, and so she had um, early entrance in and um, reserved about four or five tables we were right at we were the very first table but kind of to the side and so um, when we got in there i mean the majority of us native women that were there were all grouped together and right at the front so it was really very very exciting and 
again, to have um, been welcomed there by Vice President um, Biden, um, who spoke about um, his work in, in creating uh, the first Violence Against Men Act. And um, well, hearing, I mean, President Obama speak that afternoon to being able to witness a really frank and just down to earth conversation between uh, First Lady Michelle Obama and Oprah Winfrey um, was really exciting. And it was, it was interesting because um, Oprah had asked Michelle what she was most looking forward to being able to do once their, their term ends. And it was really cute because Michelle had said, you know, she just couldn't wait to be able to open her front door without having to, like, plan it and <laughs> get it approved by a bunch of different people. She mm. just wanted the ability to be able to open her front door and go to Target, she said. She said she <laughs> wants to go to Target. And it was really just, I mean, really down-to-earth kinds of conversation. And um, Oprah had also asked uh, Michelle what she was most proud of. And um, she said that she was really was most proud of her girls, you know, mm -hmm. and how they had worked to, you know, try to maintain normalcy for them. And how the first day that they had gone to school in a limo was, you know, Secret Service detail and sending them off, how she thought, my goodness, you know, what what have we done, you know? And um <laughs> Yeah, right. So trying, was, trying to raise children in a fishbowl. Like yeah. That. Let me ask you, what kinds of things did uh, you and the other Native women uh, want to see there? What did you take into that conference, uh, hoping to be discussed or put on an agenda? What What, what did you want? Sure. Well, um, I, I mean, obviously, the issues regarding violence against women and Native women um, were our work in that area is what brought probably the majority of, of the Native women that were there, you know, to um, to that event, to that summit. And so, um, you know, there was great conversation and great advocates that were there to speak on the work that had been done. Um, and so, you know, there was mention by the vice president about um, the inclusion of the, the tribal provisions in the last uh, reauthorization. And so, that was really exciting to see. Um, Patricia Arquette, um, you know, there were only a few speakers aside from the, the vice president. Patricia Arquette was another one of them that even mentioned Native women. And um, she had talked about um, the, the disparity in pay for women, and namely Native women um, receiving less per dollar when compared to any other woman. And so um, it was those kinds of conversations that, that were really empowering, um, I think, for those of us that were there, certainly. So again, again, the only complaint, when you look at because not only, Gary, it was supposed to start at 8.30, and they ran a little behind, and I think it was about 9.15. And so they had morning speakers, and then they broke out into some different smaller. We all left the the convention room or hall that we were in that sat 5,000 people and broke off into smaller group sessions. Um, and then came back and then had a had another set of breakouts but it was nine o'clock before it was done and while by that time in the evening there had been a lot of people that cleared out but the group that i was with it was like we were there when the doors opened so we stayed until mm -hmm. the final um speaker and it was nine o'clock and so it was a very very long day but i mean uh, amazing but again it, it really was disappointing to not have seen you know n native women up on that main stage um, because there are plenty of strong native women that you know have, have con made significant contributions and so mm -hmm. so that was they missed out on that point wasn't there a Cherokee woman that was actually brought in a group of eight to be honored? Uh, gosh, what was it? Cecilia Fields, I believe was the name, name I heard. She was... No, not not that I ever saw. Okay. No. 
No, and not not on the the main stage. And again, and and my understanding, um, again, they did have Deborah Parker from Tulalip. They featured her on one of the um, the smaller breakout sessions. But yeah, it was my understanding and discussion amongst Native women there that she was, you know, the only the the only Native speaker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you uh, got there and and kind of mingled with with the other delegates from mm-hmm. all over the nation now uh, did you feel like perhaps your concerns were different from those of just another quote unquote minority because of the federal relationship between the u.s government and and tribal governments i mean uh, did that absolutely set you apart a bit yes absolutely i mean certainly you know, the challenges and struggles that we faced are deep rooted in history and the colonization, you know, of this country. And obviously the relationship that tribes have um, with the federal government play a significant role and impact our nation's ability, you know, to make decisions about, you know, governing our people and, and um, you know, providing safety and enhancing safety for our people. And, you know, um, other, I think, groups of people, they not having that relationship, um, you know, that's not their experience. And so um, I think oftentimes we are, we are overlooked in a lot of ways. And, but, I I think what's exciting about that is that, especially, I mean, we saw with the passage, the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, the impact that tribes can have, you know, in coming together. And people will tell you, non-Native organizations and advocates will tell you that it was tribes that were really responsible for making sure that that legislation passed with the, you know, those um, provisions intact. And and so I think that just speaks volumes, you know, to the work that was done, um, you know, the, the unity that came about with that. And just even going back to the signing of, of the reauthorization in 2013 and having the ability to have been there, um, to witness, you know, President Obama sign that legislation. I mean, you would have thought that it was a tribal specific, mm-hmm. specific law because it was packed with Native people. And so, anyway, so just really, I mean, historical, um, her historical, and um, <laughs> and certainly, and again, to have been able to have t- attended the summit, and I, I mean, and we're obviously to have seen Vice President Biden, who I, you know, just, I mean. Uh, adore, I mean, his work, you know, on um, creating the the Violence Against Women Act and the president and, um, you know, he had commented and I've since seen, I think, MSNBC and different um, news media outlets um, post some different links or clips of it and, you know, him getting on stage and saying, you know, I know you guys are just here to see Michelle and Oprah. (laughs) And, um, you know, he comments, you know, I may be a little grayer than I used to be, but this is what a feminist looks like. And, you know, it was things like that that just had the crowd going nuts and, you know, just were really cool. Mm, Well chosen words there. In the time that you had to uh, share with uh, the representatives of other other nations, mm-hmm. other tribes. Um, what uh, what went on there? Did you learn something new? Uh, did you find yourselves were in similar positions, or were there things that uh, say radically different between Muscogee and Tulalip, or or whatever any other tribe that was there? What what went on there? Sure. Always, um, you know, when we have those, and actually I was there in D.C. for three days, um, the the first day being for the summit, um, again, very long day, followed by the second day were various meetings with the Department of Justice um, focused specifically on uh, violence against women issues. And so, and then the third day on the afternoon, there was a, a congressional briefing at the Capitol um, regarding uh, violence against Native women and, and 
some new research. And so there was a lot of time spent with um, women from other tribes and who I know, have gotten to know through this work and see quite frequently and really admire. And so there's always a lot of time for discussion about things that are happening in our happening in our communities. And while certainly it is hard to generalize, you know, our experiences um, based on, you know, our geographic location mm-hmm. and um, and so are the jurisdictional issues. We certainly have those differences, but so many similarities as far as, you know, the, the violence that is occurring within our communities, the challenges that we face in um, providing safety, you know, for women and children and um, relationships, the strained often relationships between the tribes and then the states, mm-hmm. you know, the respective right. states. and. Um, so there is, there's always a lot, a lot of discussion and, um, just support. I mean, because again, we're all, all native and despite where we come from, there are, we have successes and we have challenges. And I think we all try to work together, you know, to, to network and share those challenges and and successes and, you know, to help bring back to our communities and, you know, to help in, improve and enhance the work that we're all doing, which is centered around, you know, enhancing and improving the safety of our people. So, um, I guess the next question is how are we doing? Um, it's been some time now uh, since the law was, was mm-hmm. passed and approved. Uh, a reauthorization has been signed. Uh, mm-hmm. um, people have hailed it as a, uh, an answer to mm-hmm. many of the problems. Has it made any difference? Uh, and and let's, let's look at the Muscogee Nation here. Mm-hmm. Um, does it, has it given uh, our, our tribe uh, more muscle, shall we say, in prosecuting uh, offenses that happen uh, against our women? I mean, how, what's it been its effect here? Absolutely. I mean, when you think about, now granted, I don't know, and we stay obviously in very close connection with the um, Office of the Attorney General and Sher- Shelley Harrison, our prosecutor. Um, and so to my knowledge, uh, as of now, there have not been any charges filed on a non-native who has uh, committed an act of domestic violence on tribal lands, but any time that we have the ability, and again, as a sovereign nation and government, to hold someone accountable that commits a crime on our lands, I mean, that is powerful. We should have that. And so we've had to fight, and I'll always remember as Sarah Deer, um, one of our tribal members, and a, I mean, a, a fierce advocate um, and attorney, Um, you know, had said once before that, you know, Congress didn't give us anything by, by approving the, uh, the reauthorization of VAWA with this tribal provision. They only restored what they took away. And so, um, so now with us having been able to garner that support and have it included and, you know, and passed by, um, by, uh, Congress, um, the work is already being done to enhance that and open that up because right now it is a very small scope if we're only talking about crimes of domestic violence and dating violence and violations of protective orders that's a small scope um, it doesn't include crimes of sexual violence and so there is the work now to um, expand that and be able to include um, crimes of, of uh, sexual violence, and then ultimately, I think, and, and legal scholars and um, um, people that, are, again, are, are continuing in this work and the advocacy will tell you that they're hoping for an Oliphant fix, if you mm-hmm. will. And I'm not, again, I'm not a, a legal person, but um, where basically tribes will be able to hold, just like any other jurisdiction you go to, you commit a crime, you're going to be held accountable by that jurisdiction. Should not be different in Indian country. Now, uh, the phrase Indian country, let me key on that. Uh, the Oliphant case was a case that was contested on a reservation in Washington State where mm-hmm. a non-native man had been raised in hell pretty much, is the best way I can say it, is uh, on the res and was pretty smug about the fact that 
we didn't have any jurisdiction over him. He could do mm -hmm. what he darn well pleased and walk away and we couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. That case changed it. Mm -hmm. um, through the m manipulations of the legal system, it's finally uh, come to the point where uh, uh, you can't. In mm -hmm. other words, you know, you got to obey the law. If you're on tribal land, you're on tribal law. It's mm -hmm. like I go to Tulsa, mm -hmm. I break a law there, I'm under Tulsa's jurisdiction. And yes. No problem, no difference, no mm -hmm. difference. Uh, so that has changed. Now, um, one of the things we've always noted uh, is that uh, many of these these crimes, these, mm -hmm. these situations were created by um, relatives, mm -hmm. native people, mm -hmm. and let's say native men who were mm -hmm. committing these things. Has the law had some impact on them? Has it given uh, our people uh, more legal power to prosecute and follow up uh, on these kinds of crimes now? Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the the, um, the reauthorization, the inclusion of these tribal provisions, and then our tribe um, taking the steps to implement this special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction, they call it, um, which means our ability to hold um, non-native um, offenders accountable. Um, it has, I think it's just strengthened us as a nation in our overall stance regarding um, violence and violent crimes. I, in my experience, and I've been with the tribe now almost 14 years, and with family violence for about 12 and a half of that, um, the, the prosecutor that we've had in place, Shelly Harrison, for the last, I don't know, maybe four years or so, you know, it's been my experience that he, she has filed more um, charges in crimes of domestic violence than any prosecutor that we've had previously. We never used to, if we were in tribal court, maybe, I mean, it was for assisting in filing emergency protective orders, but there are a lot of cases now, you know, on um, citizens that are being filed. And I credit Shelley um, Harrison, again, our prosecutor, for, for doing that and kind of taking that stance. She's been very involved um, in this work and in the implementation, obviously, of um, the new um, tribal provisions from VAWA. And so um, I, I do think just our nation as a whole that we are evolving and we are changing our responses. and. And it's it's good. It's not it's not always easy. It's very challenging, um, obviously, to change people's mindsets because I think for a long time, you know, we've had this idea that you know that's a family matter. We don't mm, get yeah, involved in yeah, that. Yeah. We, um, um, but that is that is changing. You know, and I I credit the work of you know of our staff and providing that education and that awareness and you know talking to our tribal leaders and going out into the communities and you know and providing the advocacy and support that I mean we're busier now than we ever have been we have more staff than we've ever had um, as well I mean we've grown from I think you know we had five staff now we're up to 13 and we have some some other positions to fill and so um, so yeah I mean there's been a lot of great work and, and that's too what came out of the summit participation in the summit that there have been there have been tremendous strides um, in in issues, um, you know, advocacy issues, and just in issues impacting women. But there's still so much work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, can you measure that progress uh, in the last year or so? Is there uh, more cases filed? Uh, you mentioned the numbers were changing, but. I guess, how are we doing? Is there a statistical way to look at that? Um, what I can tell you, not um, though I know that we could easily get that information, I'm sure, from the AG's office as far as the number of cases that have been filed. Um, I, I mean, I would say, well, I, I mean, probably five, 
I would think, over the last year, um, which may not sound like a lot, but when you, when we look back, and again, us only, our staff only going to tribal court for protective orders, but now we're going on cases, you know, where criminal charges have been filed against um, perpetrators of violence, and so that is significant, and I think that while maybe there haven't been any charges or cases filed against non-native perpetrators yet obviously we have the ability to do that now we have you know a new hotel we have margaritaville that's you know that is um, going to be opening soon we have a tribal college we have multiple health facilities and properties um, in addition to other casino properties, um, gaming properties that we have. I mean, the the opportunities, unfortunately, are there where crimes of domestic violence, sexual assault are going to occur um, on these properties. And so, you know, now we have the ability to do more about it, you know. That's, that's, that's just wonderful news to hear. Mm -hmm. And you feel like we're making progress there. Yes, I, and the support... Um, you know, it used to be in this work where it was difficult to go in front of people and talk about domestic or sexual violence. And so, but again, the environment is changing. Our, mm -hmm. our attitudes, our right. beliefs, our responses are changing. And so that is promising. Oh, yeah. It's just a, a new day. All this new sun, sunlight is, is, is there. It's happening, and it's going to get even better. As we it know. is, yes. All right, and then if it's our own people that are involved in this sort of thing, then you're going to have to stand up and deal with it. It's like uh, the problem is within us, then we need to fix it and admit it rather than hide it. Absolutely, and I'm glad that you point that out, Gary, because while we might get funding from the feds and have support or whatever through grants and programming, this is up to us as a nation mm -hmm. to resolve, and I think we can do it, and we are doing it. It's a process, though, but we are doing it. Okay. Uh, one question here that has absolutely nothing to do with the subject. Was it hot and sticky in D.C. again? Oh, my gosh, it was. <laughs> okay. It was miserable, and then it was miserable coming home, so right, there's no yeah. getting away. Yeah, I lived there for 11 years, and uh, <laughs> it, it gets worse at uh, July and August, all these tourists wandering around thinking, oh, what a great time. <laughs> uh, no, you go, you go hide in the subway or stay in the shadows. Well, uh, Sean, we, we appreciate you coming in and filling us in. It must have... A uh, heavy-duty trip to have to deal with, but it sounded like you, you actually had some fun in the process. It was amazing. Certainly a highlight of my career and um, just an opportunity I was very thankful to have. Okay. So thank you for having me on to talk about well, it. Well, I'm glad you, you, could, you could find time. I know you've been busy and, and will continue to be, but we're going to come back and tag you from time to time to, to fill us in on how we're doing. I want to stay yes. on top of this subject. Motto. Okay, and go, and go. Okay, well, I uh, we want to thank Sean Partridge from uh, Family Violence and Prevention Program for coming in. Um, I think in the last couple of minutes we have, we'll just go straight into uh, uh, our announcements here. Uh, we've got a few that uh, probably heard before, but they're still out there. Um, first of all, if you're interested in expunging your criminal record, you can take the first step. There is a seminar coming up presented by Legal Aid Services of, o of Oklahoma on June the 30th. Uh, that's this week. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Monday, 6 p.m., Mound Building. That's, of course, you know where that is on the tribal complex. You can learn about expungement law, criminal records, uh, how to learn more, and ask for help from Legal Aid Services and how they help people. So if you're interested, give the uh, folks there a call, Margaret Shin, 918-295-9439, or just Cena McBee, 918-732-7780. Okay, if you're interested in eating healthy and getting away from all those wonderful double cheeseburgers, oh, that's fry bread. Uh, Muskogee Farmer's Market is coming up where you can um, visit some vendors and make selections from their fresh produce. That's uh, coming up uh, on July the 15th from 11 to 
11 a.m. to 1.30 at a vendor's pavilion there on the fairgrounds. So check it out. It might be uh, just the just thing you want to do for, for dinner. If you want more information, get a hold of Terry Anderson at 918-732-7699 or Cassandra Thompson, 918-758-8388. That is the 17th at the pavilion. Okay, the uh, Department of Health for the Muscogee Creek Nation has their community community clinic available now offering comprehensive care for several things. Uh, you can actually find some same day appointments. If you work things out, that is at the Baker Building, 1201 South Belmont, Suite 207 here in Okmulgee, that they're available for Monday through Friday from 8 to 12 and then from 1 to 5. Give them a call, 918-756-5471. And if you're a golf addict, just don't mind uh, broiling out in the sun. The Seminole Nation's got a tournament coming up on the 6th, so if you want to check that one out, get a hold of folks uh, down at the Seminole Nation. Okay. Well, we're going to cut it off right there. I want to say thank you to our guests who are with us today. Uh, we appreciate you all listening in. Madhu Mabu Hedjitskut. been listening to Muskogee Radio. Join us again next week for more local, tribal, and community news and updates. Good up.